Hey guys, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study, and we are looking at the doctrine of imminence. This is a pillar on which uh, the pre-tribulation rapture stands. If you can knock this pillar over, the entirety of the theory falls. Uh, so, I am asking the question, is it based upon scriptural evidence or scriptural bias? Uh, kind of harsh, right? Well, I mean to be harsh. It's a silly theory. So let's look at Acts 1, 6, and 7. This is one of the verses that's used to explain the pre-tribulation theory as being, or the rapture as being imminent. Uh, it's one of the, the things that's used to say, oh, well, we, we, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. It's not for us to know the time or the hour, and so therefore we, we can't know. Therefore, it must be imminent. Therefore, we can expect a pre-tribulation rapture because you can't understand when he, if you don't know when he's coming back, then you wouldn't be able to explain uh, all of the things that are supposed to happen during the tribulation uh, before he comes back. We wouldn't know all of that. Uh, so, what did the verses say? Let me just read them. Therefore, when they, the apostles, had come together, they asked him, Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now notice something here. Right, this, is, this is an utter severance, a blatant severance of context. Is, is Jesus saying it's not for you to know when the rapture is going to happen? No. He, the, the very irony of this is that Jesus' answer, the, the whole question in the Lord's answer is, is to actually attack that presumption that, that it is an imminent return of Jesus. I mean, that's the whole point of Jesus' rebuke here. It's not for you to know. Why? Because it's not the time right now for the kingdom to be restored unto Israel, which would be the rapture. That's, that's the whole point. It's not the time of Jesus' return. So, I mean, we've got this, we're, the, whole, the whole question that they're asking Jesus, it's not about rapture, it's about the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, which the pre-tribulation rapture advocates claim is, the, is Jesus' second coming after the rapture. It's the end of the age, it's the after the tribulation. Well, how can you be asking the question of after the tribulation if we're not even supposed to be there? And Jesus' answer does not seem to advocate that we're supposed to be taken out of the world before that. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Matthew 24, 36. This verse within Matthew 24, 36. Uh, let me double check to make sure I know what the verse is. Uh, but on that day, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. This is within a larger message on the end times. Uh, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus, in Matthew 24, and the parallels are Mark 13 and Luke 21, and Jesus says that the end would, proceed, would be preceded by an unequal tribulation signaled by the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. I'm quoting it. You know, this is not like I'm just pulling this out of thin air. Jesus says Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies. But first, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all nations, and the church must endure tribulation. You want to tell me, oh, that's not that's not the church in Luke 21, 12 through 19? Let's let's go ahead and flip there. Look at this. Who else could this be? Luke 21, verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. It will be it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your in your hearts not to meditate before on what your you will answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. I can keep on going from there, but what's the point I'm getting at? I keep emphasizing you. Who's he talking to? Is he talking to Israel? No. He's talking to his apostles. He's saying to his apostles, you're going to be handed up to the synagogues. You're going to be beaten by the Jews. What, 
when does that take place? Before the tribulation? Now? During the first century? Or wh when's that supposed to take place? If you read the whole context of Luke 21, this is actually during the tribulation. Well, how can you have tribulation saints being the ones who are supposed to be the saved Jews, and they're the ones being handed over to the synagogue? No, th these people being handed over to the synagogue these are the church saints. These are the church. You can't separate it. And, and my point here, if, if, we, if we see the church being, being persecuted by the synagogue, it, during the tribulation, the whole pre-tribulation rapture theory falls apart. To claim that this passage is to the Jews, but then to then the very next statement of Jesus is for the church is to perform criminal exegesis. Either the whole thing is for the church or none of it. You can't divide mid-sentence, mid-statement, and say, oh, but this part is for us and that's not for us. Okay, good. Whew. I'm glad that we got that through. Look, it's not like you're cutting up a blowfish to make sure that you don't inject the poison. It, it, you're, you're not... You understand what I'm getting at? It's not like you're trying to dissect something so that you can keep things intact. No, this is a, a flat-out cut straight through the middle of the statement. All of it goes together. All of Matthew 24 and 25 goes together. You can't say these few verses are for the church, those verses that are before it and after it are not. That's not how you do exegesis. That's not how you understand the Bible. Either the whole thing is for the Jews or none of it. Either the whole thing is for the church, or none of it. To say both is possible but impossible if it requires dividing the, up the message as if, he, as if Jesus is somehow speaking to two different people at two different times within the same message. This is not possible. It is possible to say it's to the Jew and to Jesus, or and to the church, because Jesus is addressing Israel, saying, those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Well, those who are in Judea are not just the church. You get what I'm saying? So it's possible that he's talking to two different peoples, or two, both the Jews and the Christians, but he's saying the exact same thing to them. He's not saying two different messages to them. So, what do we have next here? Um, coming like a thief. This is heralded, you know, that Jesus comes like a thief, and because he comes like a thief, he can't be coming... Uh, in a way that we would all expect him. Notice that Jesus' thief-like coming is mentioned in Revelation 16, 15 with 2 Peter 3, 10 and 12. Look them both up. You know what? How about I go ahead and just for the sake of having it on the video, making it easy for you, I'll go ahead and look it up for you. Revelation 16. This is in the midst of the bowls of wrath being poured out. This is right before Armageddon. I'll go ahead and start. Let's start in verse 14 here. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the, of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Verse 16, and they gathered them together, who? The kings, to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. This statement is sandwiched between the demons going out to the kings and gathering them for Armageddon. The thief like coming is right before the very end of the age. Are you telling me that the the thief-like coming is supposed to be the pre-tribulation rapture, and that takes place just before the second coming of Jesus, seven years into the tribulation? Is that really what you want to maintain? What about 2 Peter 3.10? Just listen to this. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, which in, in which the heavens will, be, will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will mer melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? 
How do you separate the thief like coming with the apocalypse? Do you understand what Peter's getting at? He's, he's referencing Jesus again. The thief, the coming like a thief, it's referencing Jesus in Matthew 24. And he's saying, look, Jesus even taught. There are going to be these apocalyptic signs in the heavens. You know, Isaiah taught the earth is going to uh, roll away like a scroll. These apocalyptic signs at the end of the age, with the return of Jesus, this is what he's saying is the imminent uh, day of the Lord, a thief-like coming. I mean, th this is absolutely clear. Jesus' return is the day of the Lord, which is the day of judgment and resurrection, which is the day of the thief-like coming. It is not a seven-year uh, coming in the clouds, seven years before the tribulation. That, that's not the way that you read this passage. How, can, how else can you understand it? Can you understand it severed from what he's saying? I mean, you could, but like I said, then you're, you're, then you're performing criminal exegesis. That's not the way you read the Bible. It's not the way you teach Scripture. And if that's the way you read the Bible and teach Scripture, not only are you in error, and not only are you severely deceived, you're deceiving others, and you will be held accountable. Notably, the next event after this insertion of warning, you know, the thief like coming in Revelation 16, 15, concerning Christ's now truly imminent return as a thief, is the announcement of the seven ball, which is also the great day of God Almighty. So, so for those people who want to say, oh, no, 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 the, the, the day of the Lord, the day of God Almighty, that, that's the whole seven-year tribulation. Well, then why do you have with the seventh bowl the declaration of the great day of God Almighty? Why is the day of the Lord wrapped up with the seventh bowl, the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet? It's never wrapped up with the whole tribulation. It's always the hour at the end of the age, at the very last little segment, little snippet, just before Jesus comes. That's the time that's called the day of the, of the Lord. It is with his return and with the destruction of the Antichrist and his army. It's not the full seven years. This, and not a supposed earlier rapture, is the coming that in Revelation 16, 15, and 2 Peter 2, 3, 10 and 12, I have two here, it's three. Uh, in Matthew 24, 43, by the way, is represented to overtake the inhabitants of the earth as a thief. In contrast, Paul makes it clear that this will not be the experience of the true believer. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that the day should overtake you as a thief. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4. The Lord is at hand. Sure, he's always at hand. That's the whole point of Philippians 4, 5. When you go back to Philippians 4, 5 and you read the context, yeah, they quote this verse and they say, oh, you see, this is, this is saying that he's at hand. It has to be imminent. And you, it, we went through James 5, 7 through 9, and we said, oh, you see, it has to be eminent. Read the context, though. Just go back and read the, the verses before and afterwards. He's always at hand. I mean, the prophets always spoke of an imminent devastation, an imminent king, a kingdom of the north that's going to come down and, and, and obliterate and judge. Well, imminent means what, then? <laughs> I mean, it's always at hand, signifying every person's proximity to the ever-present potential of sudden judgment. That's the point. But the doctrine of imminence, from the standpoint of actual chronology, is a disarming false doctrine that threatens to cost the church dearly. It is absolutely going to cause for the church to fall away, to be a part of that great apostasy. Romans 13, 11, and 12. We looked at this one when we were establishing um, the doctrine of eminence. By the way, the background noise is the dog. She's trying to get me <laughs> to pay attention to her. Please forgive me for that one. Um, Romans 13, 11, and 12. We can easily parallel this with 1 John 2, 8, that claims the dawn is already on the horizon and the true light is already shining. Now, does this claim eminency? Or does it claim that the apostles believe that the kingdom of God will triumph, that Jesus has already triumphed over the principalities and powers through the cross, Colossians 2.15 in reference, and therefore, with the second advent, even death shall be put under his feet? I think that's the better understanding of this passage. So, finally, Romans 16.20, that God will crush the serpent under your feet. 
In the context of Romans 9-11, through 11, where Paul explains that the fullness of the Gentiles lead to all Israel shall be saved, and that by your mercy they shall obtain mercy, only to then progress that thought into Romans 15-16, where Paul might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It, it, the context makes it absolutely abundantly clear. It is by the church laying down her life that she overcomes by the blood of the Lamb, the word of her testimony, and not loving her life unto death. It is by that offering or sacrifice that all of Israel is saved, as it is written. Therefore, Paul concludes that God shall crush the serpent's head under our feet shortly, which is actually a belief that there is a soon coming tribulation in which the church shall be a major part of. You, you, hear what I'm, you see what I'm getting at here? Okay. So I need to go ahead and wrap up and let the dog out. And uh, so, grace and peace to you. Thank you for listening. Uh, I had more that I wanted to say, but we'll wrap up early and you'll get into it when you if you follow me into the next portion of the pre-tribulation rapture. Thanks for listening and God bless. Oh, by the way, um, this little bit that I just put here with Romans 16, 20, you can go back to the dispensationalism series and you can listen to that being taught. You can see exactly what I'm getting at here. That, that's what I wanted to say. Okay, I'll see you later. Thanks for listening.